Uh, now this time, our drink is brought to us by the good people at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and their Fortnite for Freedom campaign. That's an annual push to raise awareness and promote respect for religious liberty, both uh, here in the United States and around the world. It runs every year, June 21st to July 4th. Just to prove to us that they are in earnest this year, the good people at the USCCB have supplied us with these spiffy Fortnite for Freedom drinking mugs with the, the nice little Fortnite for Freedom logo there, so we're grateful for that. And, and by the way, let me say, I think their instincts here are spot on. I mean, let's face it, reasoned arguments are great, but if you want to win American hearts and minds, beer mugs clearly are the right way to go. So so they are all in, and uh, we are delighted to bring this series of Fortnite for Freedom uh, episodes of A Drink with John uh, to you. Today, I am delighted to be joined by one of the best Catholic legal minds in the country, uh, a former clerk of the United States Supreme Court under Chief Justice William Rehnquist, now a professor of law at the University of Notre Dame. He is a prolific author and a frequent commentator in the media. I am sure you have heard and seen him multiple times talking about virtually any church-state issue that moves in this country. Uh, delighted to say hello today to Professor Rick Garnett at Notre Dame. Rick, how are you today? Doing well, John. Good to be with you. Uh, I wish I had Cheers my, you, my man. I wish I had my beer mug, but I'm with my USCCB coffee mug this morning. Well, you know, you're in the ballpark. That that's all that matters. Uh, now, listen. Thank you so much for making some time for us here today. I know you are an extremely busy guy. Uh, but let, let's start with this, Rick. You write a lot on religious freedom and on church-state issues uh, and so on. Now, the USCCB launched this Fortnite for Freedom campaign a number of years ago because at the time uh, they said they were worried about what they called a worrying erosion of respect for religious liberty in the United States. So as a legal guy, uh, first of all, why is religious freedom such a core constitutional and legal principle? And are you worried that there is an erosion of respect for religious freedom in this country? You know, it's been 20 years or so since President Clinton signed the uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and it's it's hard to believe that uh, it was passed almost unanimously. You know, these days, Congress can't seem to agree on what color the sky is, but they almost unanimously came together for the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And President Clinton, uh, in his signing ceremony, which was very moving, he called religious freedom our first freedom. And I think by that, he didn't just mean that it happens to be in a provision called the First Amendment, but that it's really foundational, that, that this commitment to freedom of conscience and freedom of religion in the American tradition has kind of been the foundation for so many other freedoms that we uh, that we cherish, that we that we hold dear. And so I think for a lot of our history, although we thought about what religious freedom meant as a concept, as a commitment, it was you know as American as, as apple pie. And again, we you, we fell short sometimes in our history. Obviously, I think what's worrying um, and what the bishops were getting at uh, when they started the Fortnite for Freedom is that. The, the sort of take for grantedness that religious freedom is important is slipping a bit. You know, when you, when you read news stories, sometimes you'll see it put in scare quotes, like it's something exotic or strange, but it isn't. I mean, the basic idea that every human being, because he or she is a human being, has a right to religious freedom, it shouldn't be controversial. But I think in, in recent years, it's become more problematic and it's become identified in some people's minds with you know, left-right divides or culture war issues, but that's that's not the way it's uh, supposed to be. It's supposed to be religious freedom as a fundamental human right and a constitutional right for all people. And, you know, you, uh, you're you under the dome there at Notre Dame, Rick, uh, which means you rub shoulders a lot of the time with, with 20-somethings, with young people. When you say religious freedom to American young people today, does it resonate with them? Do they even know what you're talking about? I mean, what, what sort of vibe do you pick up among the younger crowd around this issue? Um, so generally speaking, I think, uh, I think it still does resonate powerfully. I think I, I teach courses on the law of religious freedom and obviously many students at Notre Dame uh, appreciate the, the right that Notre Dame has to be a distinctively Catholic university. Um, it's true that in our politics today, religious freedom has become associated in some people's minds with some of these hot button debates about sexuality or contraception or marriage or abortion. And those are obviously uh, really important public policy arenas. Uh, 
But what I have to sometimes remind them is that uh, if you step back and look at religious freedom around the world, uh, where people are being persecuted by overreaching governments, uh, you remind them that religious freedom has been one of the foundational uh, international human rights. It's not just some kind of a quirky little thing that one American party is trying to use. This is something that, that the United Nations and many of our human rights documents have been um, emphasizing for, for decades. And then you talk a little history and you remind people about how the right to religious freedom has been claimed and vindicated throughout American history by vulnerable minorities, by Jehovah's Witnesses, by the Amish, by Muslims. Um, so I try to I, I try to disconnect the religious freedom issue and its importance from kind of whatever the culture war issue of the day might be. I think it's important to connect it to human dignity and human rights. Yeah, you know, let me ask you this. I, I have done a book on anti-Christian persecution. Yeah. I, I follow the stories of uh, persecuted Christians around the world extremely closely. Uh, and what I find, actually, when you talk to Americans about religious freedom, if you if you put it in the context of something like the 47 Coptic Christians who were blown up, killed on Palm Sunday when two bombs went off at Coptic churches uh, in Tanta and in Alexandria, no American disputes that that is an outrageous violation of religious freedom, and they get immediately and instinctively why it is so important to defend the rights of those people. But sometimes when you bring it into American religious freedom debates, when it's things like you know, the, the contraception mandates or, or whether you can put a nativity set on the steps of the local courthouse at Christmas time, you know, that's where people have a harder time getting their mind around it. They can understand the dramatic extreme instances of violations of religious freedom. They have a little harder time understanding the slippery slope argument. Is that your experience as well? And how do you cope with that? Yeah, I think you're really onto something. And look, the event, your book and the event you just described are reminders to me, the reminders, they should be reminders to all Americans that, you know, we're blessed, right? I mean, people like me are concerned about an eroding commitment in law to religious freedom, but you have to wake up and look around and say, thank God they're not, you know, blowing up uh, churches here in the United States. Religious freedom still is um, in, in relatively good hands. And I, I always think that it's important for people who care about religious freedom in the States to remember to care about people abroad and to, and to pray for their well-being. Um, but you're right. Um, some people think, I get it. Religious freedom is under threat around the world from overreaching governments. But here, is it really such a big deal if we're fighting about the Ten Commandments or about, uh, you know, an exemption from a particular law? Um, it is still a big deal, I think, because uh, not, not because we're on the slope to having our, our churches blown up anytime soon. I don't think that's true. Um, but if people lose the commitment to why it is that religious freedom matters, if they start to think of religious freedom as being, you know, a quirky little special pleading that a few people are trying to do, um, perhaps for political purposes, uh, then gradually their commitment to that foundation, which I, again, I believe is in the dignity of every human person, uh, that, that commitment erodes and then religious freedom does get more vulnerable. Then it becomes easier step by step to say, look, we don't need to exempt religious minorities who are burdened by general laws. We don't need to accommodate people with um, religious commitments when they're burdened by, by regulatory policy. We don't need to welcome religion into the public square. Just keep it private, that's fine. That it becomes easier and easier to say that the more disconnected uh, America's thinking of religious freedom or thinking about religious freedom is from this universal human dignity commitment. Now, look, I mean, during the Obama era, the battle lines over religious freedom in the United States seemed reasonably clear. I mean, the the, the showcase issue, of course, was that were the contraception mandates that were imposed as a part of the overall health care reform and the Supreme Court case brought by the Little Sisters of the Poor and all of those arguments that we're familiar with. Uh, but you may have noticed, Rick, we're living in a new world now. This is the era of President Donald Trump. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what you would see as some of the emerging church-state religious freedom issues uh, under this administration. Uh, I mean, it would, it would seem uh, that the contraception mandates debate is largely resolved. Uh, but, uh, you know, are there issues, for instance, uh, around the ability of faith-based groups to continue to deliver services to migrants and refugees? 
without running afoul of government interference? Or, or just what would you see uh, as the kind of emerging issues on the religious freedom front in this country? Well, uh, two things. You know, first, I'd want to underscore that even in the previous administration, the vast majority of religious freedom issues didn't involve uh, the contraception coverage mandate. Those were the ones that were most salient in the news. But, you know, in, in dozens and dozens of small cases that didn't get much notice, laws like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act uh, protected religious minorities, whether they were Muslims who didn't want to have to um, remove their head covering during their driver's license picture. And you, I could think of dozens of other ones. Going forward, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think the the place where we're going to see the religious freedom struggle in, in America kind of uh, coming to a head is going to be with efforts to, to attach conditions to things like licenses to practice medicine or practice law, the ability to participate in for a, of a hospital to participate in the Medicare or the Medicaid type programs, the ability of Catholic universities or religious universities to to get contracts or research grants or student aid money. And then the example you gave, will faith-based initiatives uh, and, and institutions be able to cooperate with government to provide social services to the poor or to resettle refugees or to fight human trafficking? Um, on, the, on the one side would be someone like me who would say, this kind of a cooperation is essential for civil society to function. You don't wanna push religious institutions out to the margins. On the other side, though, you are gonna see efforts to say, look, if you want to participate in these programs, if you want to settle, if you want to resettle refugees, you have to agree to refer for abortion, say, or you have to agree that you, uh, you won't, let's say you're a school that gets a school voucher. You have to agree that you won't teach um, Catholic doctrine for the truth of the matter, or you'll have to agree that you won't um, take mission into account in terms of hiring and admissions. This is the kind of subtle way, I think, that the distinctive religious character of these organizations can be undermined is through these uh, conditions. So I think we're going to see in the legal ar arena efforts to figure out exactly what are the limits on the government's ability to use these conditions to kind of, in a way, hum impose a homog uh, homogeneity on religious institutions. So this is a case, Rick, really, in which eternal vigilance really is the price of liberty, right? <laughs> you got to stay on top of this stuff. Yeah, I think it's it's a it's a it's a two part thing. On the one hand, be grateful for what we have and pray for those abroad who don't have the blessings of religious freedom that we have, and be vigilant, pay attention, and be aware of the fact that even though our commitment to religious freedom is in our constitution and it's been around for a long time, that it it can't be taken for granted. Uh, now, as you know, in the street and in the popular arena. A big stumbling block for a lot of people often in talking about the limits of religious freedom and so on uh, is the concept of church-state separation, that in America, church and state are supposed to be separate. Now, I know this is a topic you have written books on, you've given lectures on, you know, you've, uh, you, you are probably one of the best Catholic minds in the country on this issue. So tell us, how do we put together respect for religious freedom and the concept of church-state separation? Yeah, well, I appreciate the kind words. I'll, I'll pretend they're true, but um, it's, it, you, you raise a crucially important point. Sometimes defenders of religious freedom mistakenly think that they have to be against the idea of church-state separation, and that's just wrong. You know, the, uh, the Pope Emeritus uh, Benedict uh, remarked when, during his visit to America, I think back in 2005, that America's tradition of separation of church and state is what he called a positive or a healthy one. On that understanding, what separation means is not religion gets kicked out of public life or religious believers don't have a role in the public square. It's not a separation of faith from public life. Instead, the separation we're talking about is between religious and political authority. So in our tradition, you know, the, the bishop doesn't get to set the speed limit and Congress doesn't get to pick the bishop. And that's the kind of healthy separation that I think is very good for political stabi stability very good for political freedom. So sometimes the term separation of church and state gets waved around like a, you know, a slogan or a cudgel as if what it required was, you know, uh, no one can ever use uh, public funds to attend Notre Dame or um, as if it's a violation of uh, Thomas Jefferson's wall if the church runs a soup kitchen that gets a grant from the state. Separation doesn't require that kind of um, hostility or walling off. It permits cooperation, but what it reminds us of is that political and religious authority are not the same thing. 
they're distinct. They can cooperate, but they ought not to be entangled. The government shouldn't interfere in the internal affairs of religion, say the government shouldn't you know, tell the Catholic Church who's gonna be Bishop of Scranton or what have you. Uh, and by the same token, the, the laws that govern in the civil and secular realm should be set by elected secular officials. That's healthy separation and that's totally consistent with religious freedom. In fact, it's important for religious freedom. I, unfortunately, I've got to play my Vatican East Union card here, Rick. Uh, Benedict XVI's trip to the United States was actually 2008, not 2005. Uh, okay. Uh, but his sound, his sound bite on that trip, uh, and I remember this very well, was that the difference between Europe and the United States is that in Europe, church-state separation means freedom from religion, whereas in the United States, church-state separation means freedom for religion, and that's a key right. distinction. Yep, it is. It's a, it's a crucial distinction. Okay, listen, we're almost out of time, but listen, I can't let you go without asking you this. You are a former Supreme Court clerk. You, you have your eye uh, on the Supreme Court, I know, very keenly. Uh, let me ask, what did you think of the Neil Gorsuch appointment, and what kind of justice do you think he's going to turn out to be? Uh, I was highly supportive and, and, and remain so of, of Judge Gorsuch. I've actually known him for a while. I, I admire his writing. I admire his career in the law. Um, for someone like me, who I admit I, I wasn't uh, a, a supporter of, of the president, I, I felt very pleased when he nominated Judge Gorsuch because it struck me as precisely the kind of thing that a you know a, a mainstream uh, elected president would would have done. Judge Gorsuch is highly accomplished, highly credentialed, well respected, and uh, I think he'll be a worthy uh, successor to, to Justice Scalia. I, I don't think they're cookie cutter alike, but they I think they have a, uh, a similar skill with. With writing, and I think they have a similar commitment to the rule of law. So I'm expecting um, I'm expecting good things from him. I do believe there's reason to think that he understands the importance of religious freedom in our constitution and in our federal law. Uh, the opinions that he's written seem to suggest that to me. So uh, at least with respect to the religious freedom question, I feel like uh, a that those values will be in pretty good hands with him on the court. All right. Well, as all that plays out, Rick, we are going to continue to come to you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for the acumen and the insight uh, and the clarity you always bring to these issues. And thanks for having a drink with John. Good to be with you, John. All right. This has been a drink with John. Uh, join us next time. Uh, we will continue to bring interesting minds and voices on these issues of religious freedom around the U.S. Bishop's Fortnight for Freedom campaign. Until then, I will talk to you next time.